Hi everyone, welcome to our panel series here at It's Time. Uh, my name is Dennis Etzema and I'm the head of business to business at Ecology. Uh, unsurprisingly, we're going to be talking about the business case uh, for going green. Uh, and for this, we have a great panel. Uh, our guests today are Tom Greenwood from Whole Grain Digital, uh, London's WordPress agency for positive businesses. Uh, Heidi Clark from Anya, who helps businesses and individuals to ditch single use plastics. Uh, Jonathan Withy, did I say it right, Jonathan? That is correct. Good work, Dennis. It's awesome. Uh, from the planet Mark, driving action through sustainability certification. And May El Karuni from Globechain, who helps enterprises reduce waste through a marketplace that uh, redistributes items. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, if you're watching and you want to know more about these businesses, you can find links in the, in the profiles uh, on the speaker notes uh, for this presentation. So the basic outline is that I'll be handing over questions to each and every one of you individually. Uh, and if somebody feels like they have something to contribute, just jump in. Um, so without further ado, let's get rolling. My first question is that often it's considered more expensive for a company to be sustainable. And I'm wondering whether this is still the case or if this is an outdated perspective. And I thought, May, why don't we start with you? What do you think? Um, yeah, thanks, Dennis. Um, so this is an interesting one because obviously, you know, from a consumer angle, when you're wanting something that's like organic or fair trade or ethical, you know, you're expected to pay more because of the production is more. And I think what, um, what, corporations and enterprises have done over the years is because they're trying to squeeze uh, and make more profit and reduce prices and increase margins. Um, they've got themselves in a situation where now any type of new business modeling they do going forward is naturally going to be more expensive. And um, the problem there is that you're getting the companies talking to their shareholders and saying, you know, we, we need to change, we need to change our business models and be more sustainable, but we think it's going to cost us money short term, but long term, we think it will bring us more money. And it's a very difficult conversation to have. Um, so, yeah, it does take a little bit more cost, I would say, but I think long term, this is where the economy is going and this is what's going to drive the economy companies aren't willing to it's an investment right like anything you invest in a product and um, you keep moving with it so um, I think it's a pretty tough job for these big corporations that never had any sustainability I'd say the more newer companies coming out especially the small businesses are a bit more agile and nimble and are probably able to, to kind of bring it into their foundations of the business straight away which obviously will reduce their costs going forwards and probably benefit them and differentiate themselves going forwards as well. All right, thank you, May. Um, so Hayley, what's your take on the cost benefit of sustainability? Well, I agree with that. Uh, you know, a lot of what May said. I think that as a as a company, um, we you know we're, we're we're a small and more nimble company, and so we we have a lot of power around the choices that we make in that company. When you're dealing with much bigger companies. That prospect can become quite difficult because they're very entrenched in their processes and what they do. So undoing all of that can be quite difficult, I think. Um, so as a small to medium-sized enterprise, it's a lot easier for us to do that. But as to your question, is it is it more expensive? In the current way of things, yes, it is. In, in our experience, um, it is more expensive um, to be more sustainable. All of those things that you have to pay attention to, to every part of your um, supply chain, you know, comes into account where businesses that don't really care about that don't have those costs. So sometimes it's a bit of an unfair playing field for a business that is really trying to um, push the sustainability side of things against someone that could care less about it. Um, so we, we definitely come up against that. You know, how can I compete with a product that might be sold for a fraction of the price that we can sell it at because we've got all of these things that we put into place. So that's always a really difficult concept, um, especially for the public to understand. You know, they're looking at two items and they say, you know, this one's, you know, X cost and this one's half the cost. What's the difference, you know? And we say, oh, but we check all of these boxes. But unless you've got that ability to grab that customer when they're there making that decision, you know, it comes down to that that company that's been more sustainable to really work on their communication um, and, and try and tell the consumer um, or whoever's using their product, you know, this is why these things are so important. We've done all of this for you, whereas this company probably hasn't. Uh, yeah. And that's where the cost difference comes in. 
Excellent. So, so if I if I understand you correctly, it's it's a definitely a branding and a, a, a communication question. Uh, so, I, I would say, Tom, what, what's your take on this? I think there's sort of there's really two sides. So, one is the sort of general efficiency, um, and I think you know there's always been money to be saved by using resources more efficiently, and I think a lot of businesses know that, and they and they do pursue energy efficiency and things where it's profitable to do so. Um, purely because they're saving money. But I think that sort of gives you incremental improvements. It doesn't fundamentally change the way that things are being done. It just means that they're being done slightly less badly. Um, <laughs> as soon as you try to actually, you know, sort of redesign the business model so that you're actually not sort of, you know, destroying the planet and whatever it is that you're, you're producing, um, that then requires an upfront investment, exactly like May said, you know, it, it requires effort and time and resources to actually change things and design new ways of doing things and develop new technologies. And, and, and that requires a leap of faith for comp companies to actually want to invest in that and believe that they're going to get that money back. Um, and often when they do make that leap of faith, they're doing it on the basis that it will give them a competitive advantage, like Haley was saying, from a sort of brand point of view. But that only stands up if there's not that many people doing it. And, <laughs> and actually, from a planetary point of view, we need everybody to be, you know, pursuing truly sustainable business models and sustainability should not be a unique selling point. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, the problem comes from the fact that it, it, it is profitable to destroy the planet because nobody gets charged for the cost of doing that. You know, you, people are not being charged the true cost of cleaning up pollution, whether that's, you know, pollution in the air or pollution in the soil or the water. Um, and for destroying ecosystems. And I think that's sort of fundamentally where it comes back to is that if, if you can destroy the planet and not have to pay for it, it'll always be profitable to do so. And there will always be people that will do so, even if there are, you know, uh, a smaller number of companies that can do things in a better way and, and make that work, that won't be mainstream and, unless, it's, um, unless it's more profitable to do the right thing. I, uh, it's a very, very uh, uh, astute observation, Tom. I actually uh, I, I saw a headline and sort of skimmed an article, so I'm sure I missed a lot of the points. Uh, but it said that uh, that solar is now the cheapest form of energy uh, uh, available. So that's sort of in line with what you're trying to say, right? Like as soon as we make sustainable uh, more profitable, uh, yeah. then, then real change happens. Uh, Absolutely. What, What's your take on that, uh, Jonathan? Is there is there an ability to 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 drive profits by being sustainable, and is that available to everybody or to a select few? Um, is it available to drive profits to be more sustainable? Yeah. So I love what Tom is saying that actually fundamentally we need to change business models in order to get to where we need to go, and we we know the global challenges that we're facing, um, and we need to get everyone on board in this. Unfortunately. We're not quite there yet. So how do we transition from where we are now to to the top, the regenerative economy model where we're living within circular economy principles and things like that? Um, and we have to make sustainability profitable, right? We live in a capitalist world that isn't changing anytime soon. So if companies can differentiate themselves by demonstrating credibly that if we're focusing on products that they sell, for example, if you're a B2C company, um, how do we make it easy for people to buy more sustainably and being um, people want to buy better. So having products that credibly demonstrate stronger sustainability credentials. I didn't want, like using the word sustainability anymore because it's being overused anyway and watered down, but we won't necessarily go down that road in this conversation here. Um, that we have to, right? And it's this transition period that we're in where because of everything that's going on at the moment with the force changes that are happening that we are, I think, as a society, more open to change. So we need to double down on this change business. And um, we're experiencing a lot of the drivers are coming from the investment ESG kind of financial side of things, which I was a little bit like, OK, so what role do we have to play in this? Because it's all about making more money and all of this thing and into the detriment of the planet. But unfortunately, we we've, we've got to play the game with these guys and then um to drive the changes that we can speak and inspire change and to just touch on the the original question of um is sustainability profitable um yeah it is right i've got all these phrases so i've been doing this for a little while now and i did geography as a degree so i like looking at things from a time and space 
perspective um, and if you're making longer term investments into these things and looking at it from a slightly longer term lens such as if you've got a big manufacturing site and you want to chuck some pv panels for example from a simple perspective on your warehouse roof we know they've got an eight to ten year payback especially with the cost of um renewable energy now and things like feed-in tariffs and stuff like that so um if we're taking a longer term perspective on these things it can definitely be profitable um but i'm just yeah yeah, I yeah, yeah. waffled on a little bit so i'll stop talking <laughs> no it's excellent and I, I think the point you make with uh, with profitability that's of course you know you're in business to make a profit uh, uh otherwise you're a charity um so the vast majority of the businesses that were that 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 are making an impact they are in this game to make a profit right but the thing is you also have this pit in your stomach and this feeling that we need to do something about the planet so that's why you start taking a sustainable uh, approach. And then the question is, is it a cost center or can I actually generate a profit with it? And I see every day that people generate profits through sustainability uh, initiatives. I mean, there's a cost, absolutely. And it means that the products are higher, so they're not available to everybody. I love Tom's, Tom's point about, you know, it shouldn't be uh, a USP to, 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 that you're sustainable. Everybody should be doing this, but we're not quite there yet. And this sort of leads me into the next question, which is a subject that's very, very close to my heart. Uh, so SMEs, small to medium enterprises, they account for the majority of business worldwide and, and are important contributions, contributions to job creation and global economic development. Uh, they represent about 90% of business and more than 50% of employment worldwide, right? So I wonder how you guys believe that small to medium enterprises can make an impact. Like what routes are available and what needs to change to make it easier for, for SMEs to, to make an impact. Um, I would say, Tom, what, what, what do you think? Um, yeah, I agree. I think SMEs have a huge potential. I mean, there's a lot of the talks of in the big media around, you know, corporate sustainability tends to focus on the really big, you know, multinational corporations. But actually, as you said, you know, the majority of people in the world work for small and medium sized businesses. And so, I think there's a few opportunities there. One is just the fact that um, I think as Haley said earlier, like they're more nimble, they can change faster um, because they've just got a lot less inertia, a lot less bureaucracy. So they have a lot of opportunity and freedom to, to try new things and do things differently, which is, which is exciting. Um, the other thing is that because more people work in SMEs, even though they're, as you said, I think it's 50% of sort of, 50% um, of revenue, but 90% of employees, um, they have the power to influence a lot more people in um, beyond just like the core kind of corporate impact. They have the opportunity to influence and support, um, you know, a huge part of the population in living more sustainable lives, making more sustainable choices. So I think that's really exciting. Um, but in terms of like actually doing it, I think small businesses that often struggle just because they don't have the necessarily the in-house expertise and resources to really know how to approach it and and the time to sort of to really get stuck into these things um and i think really what we need is, is ways of making it simpler and easier just sort of more accessible of how to get started on this journey and, and implement sustainability and you know even things like you know tracking carbon emissions you know big companies have people that do that um, small businesses don't have dedicated people to do that. Um, so, and, and, you know, it often ends up being a passionate person who kind of just makes it their mission to, to do that on the side of their normal job. Um, so the easier those things can be made through like guidance from, you know, governments or, you know, other organizations and tools that make it simple, that really helps. Um, but also I think small businesses tend to complain a lot about red tape and, um, regulations that kind of is slightly at odds with um, becoming more sustainable in a way and I think that actually a, a lot of them wouldn't necessarily complain if there was some sort of carrot and not just a stick you know if it, if it was made easy and there was an incentive to do it um, I think that would be a motivating factor rather than just seeing it as like oh another another problem we've got to deal with um, yeah I, th I think that there are things that the government could do as well to make it more appealing for small businesses. Absolutely. And is there, is there a behavior that you see uh, uh, amongst your customers and that, that, you know, that's generally picked up by, uh, by people who want to take a sustainable, a sustainable action with their smaller companies? You know, is there something that they do, like switch energy providers or anything like that? Like what do you see? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is actually um, one of the key things is, 
you know, the um, switching energy providers, um, limiting flights, um, you know, those sorts of sort of looking at travel and just sort of limiting that travel as much as possible in ways that aren't necessarily problematic. But, um, you know, every, every business is different. But I think there's, there's a few key things like that that are relatively simple steps that people can take. Cool. Uh, Hayley, you work with businesses changing their behavior all the time. So I'm very curious about what you think about, you know, the, the power of an SME in this uh, global climate crisis. Look, I think um, th there there is no secret in that, you know, you start somewhere, make one change, however small it is, and then once you've mastered that change, make a second one and a third, you don't necessarily have to look at this whole big thing and say, oh, my gosh, look at all the work I have to do. Try and pick one thing. And that could be, as a, as a small business, it could be moving to recycle paper or, you know, it, it, you know, it can start really, really small depending on where you're at. And, you know, it's really important to start from where you're at. You know, I think if you put it on yourself as business owners, we always have so much going on um, that, you know, I think Tom is absolutely right. It can be a disincentive sometimes because all you see is all of this work in front of you. Whereas actually if we're just saying, okay, let's make one change this month. What can we do? You know, and even if you gave yourself the challenge to make, a, you know, an additional change every month, you know, and then over the course of the year, you've made 12 changes in your business that are getting you towards those sustainability goals. There's that word again. Sorry, Jonathan. Um, <laughs> it is. It's eco, green, sustainable. They're all over you, don't they? Um, but, you know, it, it's about that very, very thing. It's start with one thing and then master and move on to the next. And we, we run that the same whether we're B2B or B2C, it's start with one thing and, and master it and move on. And I know we always want to move quickly because we're under this time pressure and we know that things are pressing in on us, but um, we've got to make that start. And I think, um, you know, perfection um, is the enemy of progress, as the saying goes. And so I think it really is about starting with one thing and then getting better and better and better. So that's, you know, that would be my suggestion for people. Just start, start at one thing. And there are great groups out there. Tom touched on it a little bit before. Um, you know, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to name names here, but, um, you know, things like B, B Corporation and stuff like that. So we're a certified B Corporation. And I think that was really good for us as a business because it did give us a bit of that carrot and, and less stick, as Tom said, um, about actually incentivizing us to um, to really assess our business overall over lots and lots of different um, categories and, and see where the gaps were and what we could do to to be better. And they give you a framework for that, which is really nice. You don't have to think of everything. They kind of just lay it all out for you. So things like that are really great to look into as a business. And, and you get a nice little certification at the end that you can use on yours. So it, it gives you that, um, that um, I guess, that credential from the, to the customer that, you know, you've, a third party has certified you to do this thing. It's not that you're saying you're fantastic. It's somebody else certifying that you are. And I think that's really important because unless you have proof around that, um, you know, it's very hard to pick who is being genuine these days and who, who is not. You know, we all know the term greenwashing. Um, it's that classic thing where people are saying they're doing something, but when you start digging in, it's far from the truth. And so how do people know? It's very, very hard. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I love... Yeah, to a degree, I love certifications. I think it can get a bit ridiculous, but, you know, there, there are definitely some key ones that I think are great for businesses to look into. Um, and certainly they set up that framework and it makes it easier for them um, to make those sustainable changes, sorry, Jonathan, um, in, in their businesses. So, Excellent. yeah. Excellent. So so if I understand you correct, correctly, it's the journey for those involved is important there as well, right? Like if you... Absolutely. If I see one thing, it's especially small enterprises... You know, everybody gets excited about this new process that we're going to follow. We'll do it for two weeks and then we go back to business as usual and the, the new process sort of disappears, right? So yeah. I, I really believe that the part of that journey is also really, really important that you involve people and you show the progress, however small it is. So that's, so that's really good. And when it comes to the point of certification, I, I feel like Jonathan, as the, the certification representative pretty much, what, what do you think about like getting a SME uh to certify themselves it's like that that that's generally is a pretty big step how do you how do you look at it yeah i think certification is something and different certifications have slightly different approaches b corp are amazing and they help you kind of understand all the different areas you can improve on and there's a minimum scoring thing um 
and then you've got, to, I think it's three years in order to improve. We take a slightly different approach where we set you a baseline where we build you a carbon footprint so you can understand where your significant environmental impacts are, convert that into carbon and set you a target year on year in order to reduce. And you have to hit your target every year in order to keep the planet mark. Um, and any company of any shape or size can kind of measure what their environmental impacts are and it typically all sits within your financial data and actually we help measure a company's social value as well so their contribution to society and put a, a fiscal value against that um so yeah and and we work with yeah businesses less than 20 staff all the way up to a few th thousands of staff so it um it works and it provides a consistency so um and certification is that that verification and that recognition that you're continuing to do good and it's not just you saying it it's someone else has checked your numbers and, and and validates it for you it gives you that credibility that you need um but i do agree there is a bit of a sometimes certification like uh, fatigue um a little bit in terms of the and it gets and there's confusion with the consumers like what does that thing mean and what does this thing mean what does that symbol mean which is really important so it's important to explain it it's the same with terminology as well like carbon neutral climate positive carbon negative people have no idea what all these different things mean so it's important to explain it really clearly and and educate people and make people aware of what the, these different things mean excellent so that's a nice segue into into my next question. So as you mentioned, uh, people get lost in the terminology, but they also get lost in the calculation of the carbon footprint. Right? If you take two online calculators, you can put the same data, you get different answers. Right? So how easy or hard is it to accurately uh, account for all aspects of an organization's climate impact? Right? Is perfection attainable, or is it even desirable? Um, I, I would love to hear your take on that, Jonathan. Yeah, so I don't think any organization has a full understanding of what their carbon footprint is because you've got your scope one and scope two emissions, which is your direct carbon um, emissions. So your kind of your gas um, and your electricity and company owned and leased vehicles and stuff like that, which you, is relatively easy to build. And then it's the scope three side of things, which is all your direct impacts and that goes up and down. Um, your supply chains and downstream to the service that you use and stuff like that and all companies it's the big thing at the moment right scope three mapping of to try and identify where your carbon across your supply chains is so you can identify where the biggest opportunities are to improve um so yeah it's uh it's challenging but it's uh the most readily used framework for consistency is the greenhouse gas protocol which most companies sit on for measuring carbon and then it's the conversion factors that you use. So in the UK, they update and globally, they update conversion factors every year. So it's important that you're using the latest conversion factors in order to understand it, because, for example, the grid electricity mix is mix as more and more renewables get added to that mix. The actual carbon per ton of electricity or per megawatt of electricity um, generated actually comes down and improves. Um, so that's where you're going to get the differences. I would say it's in the conversion factors that you're using to convert your energy consumption into carbon um, carbon equivalents. So if you look at uh, personality types, uh, you know, the, the analysts, people who want to have a very clear one plus one equals two answer, uh, uh, this, is, this is pretty much pure torture for most of them because essentially what you're saying is you're going to get an ish answer. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, like it's never going to be, like as we say, perfect, but you're going to have a pretty good indication of what's going on. And the aim of the game is to reduce carbon anyway. So as long as we know we're continually reducing it um, as effectively and robustly as possible um, in order to try and tackle the, the climate crisis and keep temperatures below 1.5 and probably 2, right? Um, th th then that's, for me, that's fine, right? Like we've got the, the issue is so big that, that if we get into semantics and we're never going to get there so let's just try and all pull together and reduce carbon as much as we possibly can and also address all these other issues like biodiversity and all yeah. the other scary things that are out there going on at the moment you know and that's I, just I the environment yeah i totally agree with you but I'll, i believe that there's an education opportunity here as well, because I think that when people are, are talking about certification or calculations, they expect clear math, right? And, and we don't have clear math in this space, which is okay, because the, 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 the objective is to take action, right? Um, so, so, mate, your, your 
business focuses on behavioral change mainly, but I'm sure you encounter this question of calculating footprints as well. Uh, how, how do you tackle it? Um, so this was an interesting one because obviously carbon was a uh, very big five years ago when we first started. And, um, you know, we, we had a couple of companies ask us, you know, because we collect ESG data on where the items are redistributed. So we looked at carbon, but um, it, as Jonathan said, it's highly complex. You know, you can't just, you know, and, and we deal with very different types of materials from like retail, construction, medical equipment. And a lot of this is, you know, the composition of all these materials are very mixed these days. You, and sometimes you don't even know what's in them because they're like legacy assets from like 20 years ago that are being redistributed. So it's like, where do you measure that carbon from? Do you measure it from the production of those materials or the carbon embedded in that? Or do you measure it from the day it got mined and the water and the energy and then the transportation and you know, like it, it, it could kill you just like thinking about all the permutations that could happen to that product. So um, for us, we made um, a, a more kind of uh, decision as a startup uh, not to focus and assume that people want that information from day one. You know, as a start, it's highly expensive to, you know, get consultants and, and people that know how to work that out. Or as Jonathan said, you, you work out what you can um, with the information. And um, believe it or not, because of we're all about reuse, the, the types of companies we brought on board, the, the carbon side wasn't the priority data that they required from us. It was more the social impact side, because in the past they've had waste data, um, but they've never really had a breakdown of social impact data. And we break down social, economic and environmental. Um, and anyone that did um, talk to us about carbon usually had an in-house expensive team that focused on it or as Tom said somebody that had, was like a labor of love um, but what I think going forwards is I think you're going to see the companies where they know they're dealing with um, quite high carbon rates will obviously invest their money into figuring those figures out for carbon whereas say another type of company it might not be carbon that's causing the problem you know from a from a um, being more ethical and green and, and, and sustainable um, you know, going forward. So I think companies need to really look at their business and, you know, as Haley said before, take it step by step and go, okay, this process of ours, what, what's it emitting that's bad or negative, if, if anything, right? And then break that down and go, well, how do we measure that? And then that, that's how you can work it out. And um, to this date, we don't have carbon data in because uh, we calculate kilos diverted and we do the breakdown of goods and materials. So from that, if they wanted the carbon, they can work it out in a, in a way that they're comfortable with their algorithms and so on. Um, I don't believe in just sticking an algorithm for the sake of it. And, and you know, um, now there's so much kind of complicated uh, tech out there. There's AI and machine learning that actually pro probably do a very good job now. Um, whereas before, you know, pe pe people were kind of like, it was a bit more guesswork. So um, I, I think it just depends on each company, to be honest, um, you know, an oil company. Cool. Yeah, an oil company, of course, look at your carbon, <laughs> right? That should be like the top of your ESG list because that's gonna, that's what's gonna value your business going forwards. Whereas I don't know, a consultancy, for example, might have quite a low carbon um uh target because really they don't have assets they consult for other people um so so yeah you just have to i think take it case by case or sector and and work out is carbon the the highest risk for them excellent excellent it's a it's a really interesting point because i think that that especially again smaller companies will bump into this more than than, than larger enterprises uh because of the you know the choice of how do you calculate it but once you've made that choice on the back side of that, you have a communication commitment, right? So either you, you make a choice to do the calculation and then you have the communication of this is our tonnage and that's what we've done, or we've made the decision to look at other sustainable, uh, uh, like social impact, et cetera, and put the communication behind that. So that's really interesting. Thank you so much, guys. I, I thought we'd wrap up with, uh, with, with one question and you know that's for the viewers today. Um, I, I would like to give them something that they can take away uh, and, and help their business or organization uh, on the path to sustainability. So if you could think of one thing uh, that, that, that viewers can take away uh, to take action. Uh, yeah, I would love to hear it. May, why don't we start with you? Um, yeah, I think um, ask questions. 
Um, not enough people kind of ask questions and critique business from the internal side, right? Like you have a new generation coming through that cares about impact. And I see a lot of like startups and small businesses, they're creating like amazing products, some people, but you know, like, and you know, food delivery service and everything, their packaging is like terrible. And I'm like, you've got the opportunity to ingrain that in your business from day one. So it's efficient from the start, but also will bring you clients that care for it. So I think if you're in an organization and you think something can be done better, ask the questions like, how is that going to be done? Or, okay, we haven't got the money now. How can we do it in the next year? And I think just asking those questions, get people thinking, because as, as I think it was Haley that mentioned, like as a business owner, you're so focused on keeping the business running, cash flow, and especially in this, in this market and economy at the moment, the last thing you're thinking of is like, you know, is my plastic okay? But as a user, if something comes through and, you know, you're claiming like, oh, there's no bags and blah, 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 but everything's wrapped up in plastic, I'm going to be like, well, that doesn't make sense to me. So I think it's really important for the employees to, to push that because people have great ideas. And I think just ask, question, ask questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, how, how about you, Tom? Um, a, a sort of variation on a similar theme. I, I was going to say, sort of dare to question your 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 fundamental business model. I think that you know a lot of focus goes on, as I said earlier, sort of incremental improvement. Um, but you know, people have been trying to incrementally improve for decades, and <laughs> it hasn't gone very far. Um, and fundamentally, you know, sustainability is might seem like a choice now, but it's not going to be a choice in the long term. Um, and and so really daring to kind of reimagine what your business would look like in a truly sustainable economy um, will get you ahead of the game and, and help everybody in the long term. It, it, I totally agree. If you think about what COVID has been doing, it, it sort of created this perfect opportunity to ask those questions, the, yeah, the, dare, the daring questions like reimagining your business. So uh, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, how about you, Hayley? Well, you know, I think, uh, again, we, we've touched on that fact. I always come from that, that business owner perspective, and I agree with you, Tom. You know, we, I, I would love everyone to make that decision overnight and really just get into it and stop procrastinating it and doing it. The reality is we've proven time and time again we just don't do that or, or only a very small proportion of us do. So I think it's about getting that hook, you know, getting, getting, getting businesses involved with a particular hook. I mean, even things like Plastic Free July, which this year over 65 million people around the world participated in um, and that grew from a, a place here in Perth in Western Australia actually just a small little office that had 20 people in it and they said hey let's can, can we reduce our plastics um, in this office for one month can we do that and uh, you know 11 years later 65 million people around the world are doing it and I know that that might not seem very fast but it is a massively growing movement and it's just gone from 20 people to 65 million over that 11 years so I think making small changes and hooking people in with those changes and I think as both you and May have, have both um, you know, touched on you know question your business and how you're doing it and how can you be better and then taking that one step um, and then just, you know, and another and another. Um, and I know that's incremental change, um, but I've just seen it work too many times in, in, in the areas that I'm involved in and seeing people come from absolutely being unaware to being hyper aware and making those changes that I've seen that work and I, and I think that you know, that, that would be my advice is, is definitely question, as May and Tom have touched on, what you're doing in your business and what can you change? Um, but then start with one thing, make that change, move to another and just keep moving into those changes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and Jonathan, how about you? Yeah, on the, on the, on the continue on the questions theme, right? Um, allowing, uh, creating a forum in which those questions can be asked is really important. So if you don't already have a team of kind of sustainability champions, which are, we're seeing a lot of the drivers of this um, this change is young people, right, who want to work for a company that's doing more good and are super passionate about it. So take allow them to take their passions from outside of the work and bring them in and ask those questions. And then following up on that, start measuring, right? So when you do start making those changes, you understand the impacts of those changes are making, so you can double down. And then as a, like a small bit of practical advice that I think Tom touched on earlier is look at your energy supplies and, and switch to renewable energy supplies. We know that green is just as competitive, if not more competitive than brown now. So that's a really easy thing that you can do. And there's plenty of providers out there who can help 
um, yeah, such as the ecotricities and the good energies and open energy markets of this world who can who can make it really easy for you to do that. And easy is the other word that I use a lot, right? Easy and, dare I say it, profitable, Tom, sorry. So uh, yes, these things are really important to drive the change that we need to see, but then coupled with the reimagining of what do we want business to look like um, going forward within the decade of action that is now. So, so the combination is ask questions, take action, and empower the people around you to take a step. Absolutely. So, it gives them yeah. a stronger sense of purpose within the organizations that they work for. Yes, exactly. I, I, and I couldn't agree more. Again, I always come back to that pit in my stomach. I mean, that's that when you see the climate emergency happening, that's the feeling you get. Uh, address that, take action. I like to say it's climate action, not perfection. So Haley, uh, Haley and I are very much on the same, same line there. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for, for your time and your input. Uh, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, again, for the viewers, uh, if, if you want to learn, learn more about these fantastic individuals and their businesses, uh, make sure to check out the profiles, uh, uh, go to their company pages, hit them up on LinkedIn, and uh, yeah, take action. So thank you so much for today, everybody. Thank you so much for having us.